I think the title is about getting physical, but more importantly, this will be a discussion about DOCSIS 4.0 technology today. Uh, DOCSIS 4.0 has actually got a lot of flexibility built into it. We've got stuff called full duplex DOCSIS, also known as FDX. We've got what I'm going to start calling extended spectrum HFC, ESH, instead of extended spectrum DOCSIS or electrostatic discharge or some other name. We'll see if we can make ESH stick. Uh, these technologies associated with the DOCSIS 4.0 actually provide a lot of flexibility to the cable operators, and they're going to provide a lot of opportunity to the supplier community as well. Uh, what's really going on here now is to realize the 10G vision, and yes, I had to use 10G here. We've all been 10 g -ized. Very good. Oh, hey, Joe. Um, to realize the 10G vision, uh, the operators are going to need to touch their plant. And that's as much to get more upstream capacity as it is to get more downstream capacity and head towards that actual 10 gigabit mark. So since the plant is being touched or evolved as we like to see or invested upon, whatever you want to call it, uh, different operators have different methods to invest in their plant or to morph the cable plant. Uh, you can either, you know, basically either you do a drop-in upgrade or move the node plus zero or some combination of the two. And it's really based on the operator's plans for their own HFC that DOCSIS 4.0 now contains these different technologies, FDX or ESH. That's really the driver be between it. Um, operators are going to pursue DOCSIS 4.0 uh, to be competitive, um, to expand the capacity of the coax. And believe me, uh, we can get to 10 gigabit um, this next modem. Just wait till you see what it can do. Anyway, today's panel contains papers on both of those technologies. They're both DOCSIS 4.0. We'll have Shaul Schulman from Intel talking about FDX DOCSIS, and we'll have Ron Wolf from Charter talking about ex well, extended spectrum HFC, ESH. I even got to get myself going here. Let me introduce Shaul first, senior director, I'm sorry, senior architect in strategy and technology with the Connected Home Division. Shaul is based out of Tel Aviv, and he's been involved with DOCSIS for a while. I guess I'll let you say how long, but I know it's been all 3.1 and FDX. Um, Shaul will specifically be talking about the FDX L cable modem, which is quite interesting, actually. It's uh, the DOCSIS 3.1 modems. All use OFDM and OFDMA, and full duplex DOCSIS is based on OFDM and OFDMA. So the FDXL modem was a way to allow that DOCSIS 3.1 modem to participate in some of the full duplex uh, operations. And it's going to be quite important if an operator chooses to go the full duplex route. So, Shell, we'll let you get started. Is my presentation? I think so. I hope so. <laughs> Could be. Okay. Thanks, Doug, for the introduction. Just to to complete, I think I've been uh, 15 years involved. That makes me a junior, I think, in the cable industry. Okay. So the topic that I am going to talk about uh, today uh, is not just the uh, FDXL, but just a general question of coexistence of legacy. Uh, legacy cable modems in a plant that is FDX or actually 10G plant, maybe this is a ESH, is it the new name H. from today, from this morning? We're going to try. Okay. So it's a, it's a, a, um, a quite important topic, I think, for the operators, for the operational questions of uh, coexistence of legacy with the new modems. So uh, first, uh, we'll describe what's the actually what what the, what the problem statement is and what are the use cases. Uh, characterize the, the interference. Um, talk about the potential impact on the legacy CMs that uh, um, as, can happen as a result of this interference, and suggest uh, mitigation methods. 
Okay, so, so what's the issue really? So this is uh, actually taken right away from the, uh, um, straight uh, from the DOCSIS 4.0 specification. This is the familiar to most of you, I guess, uh, frequency plan for uh, uh, 4.0. And the uh, thing to notice here is the downstream, it's the, the upstream spectrum is a, uh, can go as high as 684. And um, this is where the upstream transmission is going to happen for the, uh, uh, for the 10 G modems. But one thing to remember that this is actually the downstream band that is, um, was designed to be downstream for all the legacy modems that are already in the plant today. And uh, the issue with that is can be illustrated here with the, um, on the, um, this uh, simplified aplexer architecture basically in any in any receiver, cable modem receiver, you'd have a, a diplex filter that is distinguishing, is separated between the upstream band and the downstream band. And on the downstream receiver, there is a high pass filter that filters out any, un, un, um, any uh, unnecessary uh, interfering energy from the upstream band. The problem here is that the, the upstream transmission is now gonna go through this filter. So uh, what are the uh, possible use cases that uh, uh, we should address? So uh, first one is just the plane coexistence with a, a FDX modem on the same plant, whether uh, that modem that is needs to coexist is bonding channel or not with that modem. Uh, the FDXL that uh, Doug mentioned is actually, um, FDXL is a 3.1 modem that has a firmware that enables it to understand um, MAC messages of FDX and actually participate uh, and, and share the same uh, channel, bond same channel with FDX modem in the FDX band. So this is in this diagram, it will look like this here. It's one use case and the other use case actually anything, um, anything that has upstream transmission above, um, above the Legacy, um, legacy splits, legacy frequencies, and, and it falls under the FDD um, uh, category, which is basically what is the, the, uh, uh, the extended spectrum solution gonna look like. So I think it can be summarized that everything, it's a coexistence with any uh, form of DOCSIS 4.0 transmission. So first, uh, let's see what, what that interference actually, how bad is it? Uh, let's try to characterize it. Okay, so uh, let, let's just first uh, under, understand what is the level uh, the, between uh, the upstream interference at the, pres at the input of the receiver and the, the downstream. Okay, the, uh, the level is determined by uh, the coupling between the aggressor cable modem and the victim cable modem. And uh, uh, the, most of the issue is actually when the aggressor cable modem and the victim cable modem, they share the same, uh, same tap. Uh, on other taps, there is additional attenuation that makes it kind of negligible. So we can narrow down the analysis to the same tap. And what we have is an aggressor toxis for cable modem then um, transmitting and you have the drop cable, the tap uh, port to port isolation and then the drop cable of the, uh, uh, the victim and this is the cable modem to cable modem coupling here in this column. And then what we can take is we can assume a maximum tr uh, transmit power that's allowed by the spec of that aggressor modem, aggressor modem and and uh, just calculate what it's gonna be relative to the, some typical numbers for the reception. So here I took one dBmV per six megahertz and plus six dBmV uh, plus six megahertz. And you can see that depending on different scenarios and the scenario um, is a combination of uh, the drop uh, length and uh, the, uh, I'll assume RG6 here on all the, all the drop. The, the cable type of course also um, has an impact and the uh, tap-to-tap isolation ratio, which is probably the most important parameter. 
And uh, I took some typical, typical numbers, and you can see that there is a quite a wide range. But for a more typical case, we get in the range of between 4 to 10 dB. This is what DOCSIS 3.1, uh, 4, 4 .0, sorry, specification actually assumes uh, in the test, in the say, compliance test that, that appears in the DOCSIS 4.0 specification. Okay, now in order to understand actually what, uh, what impact uh, those inter this interference can have on a cable modem, it's important a little bit get some insight into the cable modem architecture, receiver architecture. Uh, so luckily it's quite easy to identify the type of, the general type of the architecture based on the, uh, of a cable modem based on its ver uh, supported DOCSIS version and the number of supported downstream channels. So for, uh, for uh, DOCSIS 2.0 and earlier versions, one channel is single channel narrow, narrow, narrow band receiver. For DOCSIS 3.0, uh, 2 and 4, uh, four, sorry, four and eight uh, downstream channels that will be a wideband uh, receiver, which is kind of similar architecture to the signal channel receiver. And from 3.0, we have 16 channels, uh, and 3.1, all the uh, cable modems, they have a full band architecture. So let's just take a look on this, those two, two architectures. Very high level, a generalized kind of uh, view. So, so basically, you can, you can take a look at this and uh, from the analysis for our purposes, it, it consists of uh, three parts. We, uh, we have uh, the input signals coming in and the job of the, the receiver or the tuner, how is it called, is, is to down, down convert the desired channel uh, and then digitize it and uh, pass it to the demodulator. So the first uh, stage is usually low. Uh, it's uh, amplification stage, low noise amplifier with the AGC. And here the, the AGC is making, uh, optimizing between uh, the uh, thermal noise and the distortion, um, assuming the, looking at the total energy that is here. Then there is analog tuning channel uh, and, uh, and channel selection, which can uh, differ for, for, any, for each specific architecture. And then there is uh, IF AGC that, that sets the um, the gain for the AGC. So what, what's important to note here is that the, the total gain uh, for the desired channel uh, cannot, it needs to be uh, either continuous or, or, or constant, can, cannot uh, have any jumps, right? Uh, for the, for the, so the demodulator doesn't, uh, cannot suffer disturbances in the, in the input channel. So what happens is, is, is if, the, if the channels here are really bursty, this is how upstream, they are very high in energy and they are bursty, which is how upstream transmission is, uh, behaves is that you can have a little bit, uh, um, you can have um, effects that are not so uh, uh, unpredictable effects. So especially say the CLNA can go out of its, uh, momentarily even until the AGC uh, locks can go out of its comfort zone, let's call it when there is a optimal balance between uh, thermal noise and, and nonlinearity and have some uh, nonlinear products that can then fold into the desired channels and other effects, okay? And the uh, full band uh, receiver uh, a case, it's the, the architecture in concept is similar, but there is one uh, key difference, which is important actually for, uh, for the issue uh, that we're discussing here, is that the um, uh, same, there is an, an LNA, but now uh, the, there is an ADC that, that samples the entire input signal range, and the, 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 uh, the tuning and channel selection is done digitally. So what it allows is that it allows that to AGC, uh, allows the digital to control the AGC, and the difference between, let's say, this ADC here, that ADC here is that here the ADC is aware of everything that's going on on the plant. So we always, we also, also will be able to see the interference unlike this one that, uh, that is just looking at the desired signal. So if you have this uh, capability, then, then that, that there, there are some, some adjustments that can be made, and I'm gonna be talking about it a little bit in a few minutes. So what are the, the uh, impairment, uh, different types of impairments that, that, that can happen? So first, I already mentioned this is some non-linear products. This is here just an example of how third-order distortion behaves if you have its 
two signals, then you will have a products that are on the left, on the right uh, of the spectrum uh, with the same frequency uh, uh, gap. And uh, suppose this is your interference, and this is your desired. Uh, if that LNA creates uh, uh, this product that will fall into the desired channel, then it's not going to be filtered out uh, further down the chain because it's, a de it's, a desired, into the, it's in the desired channel, right? Um, the other issue, um, these are two issues, is ADC clipping and ADC dynamic range reduction, which is actually two sides of the same coin. I have an illustration here. What happens is that when you, when you sample the full band, uh, there is uh, the des uh, desire to optimize, in order to optimize the ADC dynamic range, and let's mention that in order to get this 4K qualms for this uh, wide band, you really, uh, uh, the cable modem vendors are really pushing uh, the, 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 the boundaries of feasibility of the analog digital converters. If you take a look at, uh, I have a reference to it in the paper, um, if you look at the survey that there is a, a Boris Moorman from Stanford, a professor that is doing a survey of all the uh, ADCs that are out there that, uh, that are published, yeah, the cable ADCs uh, close to the border or sometimes off the charts. So it's, it's very kind of, um, it's, it's a very, it's a very uh, important asset, the ADC dynamic range. And that's why the, the good design would be to optimize, to, to optimize the signal so that it's, it's, um, it's amplified to the maximum possible uh, range before it goes to the ADC. But on one hand, on the other hand, it, it cannot clip. So it looks like a Gaussian uh, signal, and uh, you want to have some certain back off so that the clipping will not happen. What happens is if, that's, if suddenly um, your energy is uh, rising, significant uh, part of the, the spectrum is suddenly bursting, suddenly rising, you will have the AGC loops will not be able to and should not be able to recover immediately to that, and uh, so you will have the ADC clipping effect. And, uh, ADC clipping can have uh, quite a nasty, nasty consequences, and uh, and uh, depending on the on the clipping rate or the clipping, uh, the the amplitude of the clipping, that it can cause uh, um, severe issues to the demodulator. Uh, one way to deal with it is just to add extra headroom to prevent this clipping, but then your your actually noise is uh, is kind of increased because your signal is lower versus the the inaccuracy of the ADC. And another uh, uh, impairment, which is actually more relevant to the uh, FDXL modems, which have uh, downstream right near the, the upstream, uh, right adjacent to it, is the what is called a ALI, adjacent leakage interference where just the skirt, or let's say the out-of-band emissions of that upstream signal, they, they go in and uh, into the frequency of that downstream, downstream signal. So that's another, another phenomenon. Okay, so what are the actual possible uh, mitigation methods to this? So one, and uh, probably the uh, most um, useful one or straightforward one is actually improving tap, uh, tap port to port isolation. And this specifically can be interesting for the 1.8 tap upgrades. Uh, for ESD, uh, you most probably need to, to upgrade the taps anyway. So if that comes with uh, increased port to port isolation, that's uh, gonna significantly help uh, deal with this issue. And that port to port isolation needs to be, it doesn't need to be improved uh, all, uh, along the uh, all the band uh, of the tap. It just needs to be approved in a certain areas where the, ups, the, the highest upstream transmission is actually intended to be. So actually this paper is a good, maybe a good guide where, uh, where to improve the, the port-to-port -port isolation by how much. Uh, another method is kind of a straightforward, not sure how it's actually um, a practical or not, but uh, putting a filter in front of legacy modem on that band that will solve the issue. Um, Cable modem AGC setting adjustment. So luckily uh, for the full band modems, uh, it's, uh, the AGC is controlled by firmware. And you could add that extra headroom that I mentioned before. 
and uh, prevent at least the clipping, uh, the clipping uh, effects on, on the expense of some, uh, some maybe little uh, reduction performance, and I have a slide on that uh, coming up in, um, in a couple of minutes. Um, you could uh, control the TX power, so uh, the interference, of course, uh, proportional, directly proportional to the, to the uh, transmission uh, of the modem, and uh, the, uh, the CMTS, actually, is the one who is controlling that power, so uh, um, if there is a way to smartly uh, allocate where, the, where, does, where there is a, um, to allocate if there is a situation where there is a victim modem and a near that aggressor modem, you could um, reduce the, the transmit power of the aggressor modem and, and mitigate the issue by that. That's kind of, that's also quite straightforward um, without uh, any hardware. Um, modulation coding scheme downgrading. It's both true for the aggressor and the victim. So if you reduce the if you reduce the upstream power, uh, maybe uh, it will mean that the upstream uh, modulation encoding or throughput uh, may, may, may get, get impacted. Uh, you can do the same also on the receiver uh, modem. Uh, if 3.1 is quite flexible in terms of uh, trading uh, SNR, trading performance uh, for, uh, for throughput. Uh, 3.0 is less so, we have 26 qualm or 64 qualm, but there is room on uh, both and then you can get, you can trade robustness versus uh, throughput. And the last one is, uh, it's not really a mitigation method, but it's a kind of a byproduct effect uh, that happens if you don't utilize uh, the f fully the, the FDX band or the, the upstream band. And I have a slide on that too. Okay, so that so regarding that AGC uh, setting, so the, the, I mentioned that they, the AGC that, that cable modems have is a state of the art AGC. And the question is, is okay, um, sorry, is there a, enough headroom to add this extra headroom for uh, for FDX or ESD transmissions? And to answer these questions without going to any uh, specific vendor implementation or anything like that, uh, just uh, I, I did here a simple analysis where um, I'm showing here building a very simplified model of a full band, full band receiver. It has uh, input CNR coming from the network. Um, there is a AGC implemented with attenuator and a, and a amplifier of gain noise figure ideal tilt compensation, and ADC, and then some implementation noise assumed, and the demodulator. Uh, and then uh, I run uh, an input scenario through this model, and this input scenario is straight from the DOCSIS 3.1 spec. It assumes uh, the, the yellow here is the desired channel, and the, um, the reds are the, some of the adjacents, and the blue is uh, far away adjacent, and uh, what you get here is then you, f uh, then I fix all the parameters here, fix all the parameters and draw a chart that has, uh, it's a heat map that actually showing a margin you have over uh, SNR that you need for 4K QAM. So this scenario point is here, and now the, the uh, axis of the chart is CNR, so we're varying the CNR and varying the back of now the back of is defined as the difference between the, your desired channel and the rest of the energy in the, in the incoming plant. So if you, if you design just to be a little bit over the margin, this is where you, uh, you will have here, and this is 41 dBs CNR, it's a Dr. Spirit 1 requirement, and the back of that you get from this uh, setup is about uh, 26 here. Now if you, if you do, uh, if you assume 10 dB more uh, upstream power, then your, your back of grows from to about 30. So this is the line actually uh, that you will get if you have a modem designed just to pass DOCSIS 3.1 and you take this modem, it just passed DOCSIS 3.1 and now you wanna test, you wanna do this HC setting upgrade, what you will get. So you'll, you, you, will, you will get a, a 2K, 2K performance is kind of a, 
let's say specifically in this example is guaranteed and 4K is a stretch. If you have a little bit, I didn't go here higher on the, on the CNR, but um, if there is a better CNR than this, you see this line is actually going down approaching, approaching this line. So the takeaway from here, and usually, okay, we models vendors may have um, margins on top of just passing the minimum specifications. So the takeaway is that, that at least 2K is something that it should be with this, uh, with this fix, something that at least the 2K should be, should be in the pocket. And the, that, the idea here is that you trade extra headroom for, uh, pre, uh, for preventing uh, clipping effects. Okay, last slide before summary. Um, this is uh, to graphically show the partial frequency occupation um, um, issue. Now, so, so, or the, the effect. Now, now the, this is here, the, 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 uh, these bars in between uh, the blue, uh, the blue lines are the different uh, possible uh, upstream band allocations from the FDX spec. Okay, and then I just calculated simply how much uh, the energy would go down the total energy here would go down if you only have a partial allocation. So for the full, uh, the reference is a full FDX allocation, but if you only allocate 96 megahertz, it's, it's about 11 dB down. And uh, remember, if we're talking about that plus 10 dBc, that will actually um, make it uh, a non, uh, uh, will make it flat with the downstream uh, received power, and so on. So in summary, uh, I could say that uh, uh, the issue is uh, mostly limited to the same tap and probably somewhere around 50% of the FDX band allocation is where it becomes quite significant. Um, the AGC headroom fix is, is possible for full band uh, capture cable modems. Uh, other mitigation methods were uh, suggested. Perhaps there are also others that we couldn't uh, think about. And uh, one thing that is recommended for, for the operators is to characterize each cable modem uh, model uh, separately, set uh, kind of benchmark uh, requirements and see how the cable modem uh, behaves under those conditions to be sure that uh, no surprises uh, will, be, uh, uh, will happen in, in the actual deployment in the field. So, thank you. Questions later? We'll do questions at the end. Thank you, Shaul. Very interesting. So, you know, Shaul, his paper contained a lot of key points about FDX and uh, full duplex doxis. And we'll, we'll do questions uh, after Ron gets up. But, you know, the, the abutting spectrum, the no diplex filters in the FDX band, uh, expecting, well, not expecting, but operating out the 4,096 QAM. Um, Intel, and thanks Intel for sending you here, but they are really working to make the modem do this stuff. So um, get your questions ready. Next up will be Ron Wolf, who is um, Senior Director at Charter. Ron is based out in Denver at their CTEC, Charter Technology and Engineering Center, South Denver again. Ron. Um, is very active in the SCTE. He was member of the year last millennium, one year. So uh, he most recently got term limited off the board of directors of the SCTE. And he'll be re-engaging with um, the Rocky Mountain chapter, our chapter out in Denver. So anyway, um, Ron, let's get you up here. We will get your deck up. Thanks, Doug. Um, yeah, the member of the year thing was quite some time ago, uh, but I have, I can take some comfort in knowing that uh, there's at least one member of the year in the room who uh, was uh, privileged to receive that honor long before I did. So, uh, Shaul, uh, it looks like I've got plenty of time to get the outside plant upgraded while you figure out uh, some of the challenges of the uh, customer premise equipment. Uh, and uh, in, in the case of the outside plant, uh, it, it truly does uh, get 
touched in, in, in almost every way when we start talking about moving to 1.8 gigahertz. Uh, some things that we've taken for granted over the years, we have to think through a little more thoroughly. Um, the drivers behind this, I'll go through this fairly quickly. Uh, I think we all know that just between the cumulative average growth rate uh, and competitive pressure, you know, those forces continue to drive the need for incremental bandwidth in our networks. Uh, that hasn't changed in closer to the mic. That hasn't changed in a couple decades, and, and we don't expect it to change in, in the next decade or so. Uh, there are a lot of new contributors to the bandwidth demand as well. Um, IP video, cloud computing, virtualization, IoT, lots and lots and lots of different uh, devices that want to uh, consume bandwidth on the network, and uh, that, that will continue to grow exponentially uh, in the future. We've got some upgrade options uh, available to us, uh, and of course, how you get to where you want to be depends on where you're at today. That's, that's always been the case. Uh, that's why each MSO makes their own decisions as to whether they feel that a particular approach or a particular technology is better for them. Uh, extended spectrum uh, can mean many things, uh, may or may not include uh, FDX. Fiber to the premise uh, is certainly a viable technology, and I think almost every MSO is to some extent or another building fiber to the prem. Uh, there are some, some uh, complicating factors to that as well. It's, it's probably today, I think it's fair to say that it's more common in a greenfield, a new build environment than it is in a, a brownfield or a uh, existing plant environment. Uh, coax has the advantage of being ubiquitous uh, and uh, it's upgradable. We know that because we've done it three or four times already, uh, starting at you know, 300 megahertz and 400 and 450 and 550 and all, all the other stops on the way, uh, with uh, most of us now operating networks that are a, a mix of probably 750 megahertz, uh, 860, and 1 gig, with a few 1.2 gig out there. We're not going to be able to get to all of the things that we need to do and how to do them uh, to get to 1.8 gigahertz today, partly because there's not enough time uh, and partly because we don't have all the answers yet. I'm not going to stand here and tell you, here's how you're going to do that. I'm going to stand here and say, we've got a lot of stuff to think about over the next couple of years, and, and these, are, these are some of the bigger ones. It touches uh, just about uh, every area of the network, coax cable and connectors, analog transport, digital transport, RF amplifiers, taps, passives, CPE, uh, Shaw already gave you uh, some insight into some of the challenges there. And then uh, we've got some uh, compatibility, backward compatibility issues, which we always have when we go to uh, upgrade or implement some new technology that we have to, uh, we have to deal with. We can't just strand our existing equipment and customers, uh, and it's uh, virtually impossible with uh, the scale that we have to you know, flash cut uh, anything anymore. So let's start with uh, coax cable and connectors. Right? How high can this stuff go? Uh, well, there, there are some theoretical, or, well, not theoretical, but some, some mathematical limitations in how a coax cable behaves as a conductor at higher frequencies. But if we go out and look out as far as three gigahertz, we don't think that, that the fundamentals of transmission over coax cable are going to change dramatically. There will be some, some you know, areas, uh, frequency areas that we may have to skip, those types of things. But uh, the biggest challenge that, an immediate challenge that we have to deal with is just the nature of coax cable. The higher the frequency, the higher the loss. So as the, fre the loss goes up by a formula that says the, it's the square root of the highest frequency over the lowest frequency is the multiplier that you apply to the loss. And what that means basically is to get from you know, the 860 megahertz, one gigahertz range up to 1.8, there's about a 35 to 40% uh, increase in the attenuation of that coax cable. Uh, there's attenuation increase in the taps and passives as well, but it, it's primarily uh, uh, related to the uh, coax cable. And uh, the one thing that I should point out is that nobody has a network of coax cable out there that has a data sheet that says this is what the loss is going to be at 1.8 gigahertz. It wasn't until the mid-90s or early the mid-90s that people started to spec our coax cable out to a gigahertz. And I suspect that most cable operators would nod their head acknowledging that we have a lot of coax cable out there that was deployed before the mid-1990s. In fact, probably the majority of it, if not the overwhelming majority of it. It's been there for a while. So we don't 
have the ability to sit down with a spreadsheet and say this is what it's going to look like. So we've uh, been working uh, with a small group of MSOs together and what we're doing is we're just going to go out and splice in some uh, uh, high frequency uh, passive devices into sp passive spans of cable and characterize those spans of cable for what their performance is going to be out, out to three gigahertz. Uh, and the taps that we're putting in don't necessarily perform to three gigahertz, but we can, we can sort of net those out mathematically to say this is what the coax looks like out, out to, out to three, three gigahertz. Early indicators, not a lot that you would be surprised by uh, because this is what we found when we deployed HFC. This is what we found when we went to 860 megahertz. This is what we found when we went to one gigahertz, that some cable's gonna have to be replaced due to physical damage. Some express runs may need a larger cable size. Some portions of the spectrum may have some impairments in performance. There might be you know, suck outs at certain frequencies that are, that are potentially unique to a particular manufacturer's uh, cable and the process that they use to make it. The only way that we can really get our heads around that is to go out and do some sampling until we've got something that's statistically significant. Uh, just a quick look at a lost table. Uh, this particular one, I don't know which of uh, the two it is. I looked at uh, Amphenol and I looked at uh, Comscope, and they're they're pretty close to the same uh, in, in all cases. Just gives you a feel of you know what it looks like to move from 860 megahertz, where a lot of us are at today, or in that range, out to 1.8. And here you see it's like 2.3 to 3.5 uh, are the uh, dB loss per 100 feet in this case of coax. Drop cable, same thing, obviously. So getting to the coax cable, excuse me, um, we've got a couple of ways to get there. Uh, a lot of us, most of us, almost all of us use uh, analog optics today to get there. It's just a uh, either direct mod or potentially a uh, externally modulated uh, optical transmitter out to an optical node in the field. Uh, there's, there's no no rules of physics have to change for that equipment to be useful at 1.8 gigahertz. It, it's, the spectral loading is going to increase. Uh, if you leave the drive levels the same for any given, any given laser, you're probably going to clip that laser in the, uh, uh, in the forward direction. Most of us are used to thinking about ingress and impulse noise events, clipping lasers in the upstream direction. What well, can happen in the downstream too? And uh, we're going to need to manage the uh, optical modulation index in order to be able to assure ourselves that we're not going to be clipping lasers in the downstream direction. Additional carriers on the, on the optics mean additional intermodulation, additional crosstalk, possibility of clipping I already mentioned. And as you take the level down, uh, of, uh, the uh, drive levels, then of course you potentially have carry to noise ratio issues as well. So there's a, there's a balance point in uh, the optical design, but we, we fully expect that we'll be able to get there uh, for those people who are staying on analog optics. Uh, there's no reason that you can't take that to uh, 1.8 gigahertz. Again, as you move the upstream-downstream split, because in analog optics you are dealing with uh, a separate transmission uh, mechanism for the upstream and the downstream, if you take carriers away from the down, the, the bottom end of the spectrum, then that allows you to add carriers at the top end of the spectrum. It's not exactly a one-to-one -one thing, uh, but you can, you know, use, take advantage of the fact that you are with a higher return split. You've got, you know, maybe that bottom two, three hundred megahertz of uh, uh, capacity is not going to be used in the downstream direction. Uh, upstream transport, we're going to need higher quality lasers. Uh, they're probably going to uh, uh, virtually any of the analog stuff, I suspect, unless somebody has already uh, anticipated this, is uh, going to be presented with a much higher uh, spectral load. Instead of 5 to 42 megahertz, we're looking at, you know, 5 to potentially 492 megahertz, so, which is a very significant increase in the uh, spectral loading on those uh, return optics. We're going to take a careful look at what's the, what's the right way to do that. Whether that's, whether that's digital return, whether that's analog return, either way we're going to have to deal with it. Digital return doesn't make the, the problem of uh, power loading uh, on the return optics go away. It just digitizes it first. Uh, again, OMI is going to be something that we have to pay more attention to in the upstream direction as well. 
Digital systems a little bit different uh, and a little bit more straightforward. Uh, I, I talk of digital transport in the sense of the uh, remote Fi devices, remote Mac Fi devices that are basically using 10 gigabit Ethernet as a transport mechanism today. 10 gigabit Ethernet, as you know, is, is pretty widely available. It's a well understood technology. It's you get good density on the fiber because you can, can load up the entire uh, ITU grid uh, with wavelengths. But how long will 10 gigabit Ethernet transport serve us as an industry? We're just getting going deploying remote Fi devices out in the field with 10 gig Ethernet backhaul. What happens when we go to you know, a two by two? Uh, remote Fi device. That, that's probably serviceable with 10 gig. But how much farther do we get down the road uh, in getting to a 2x2 two two with 1.8 gigahertz of, uh, of spectral loading? And can we, can we still do that on a single 10 gig for a 2x2 two two node? Uh, we'll, have to, we'll have to find that out. Uh, if not, well, it's, we, we already know that at some point we're going to have to look at higher line rates anyway, whether that's 25 or 40 or 100 gigabit. And that brings with it, you know, oh, well, how do you aggregate all of these small devices out into the field into some high capacity transport as well? Um, and that's not, uh, there are people who have devices like that uh, available today uh, that are aggregators uh, for field use, uh, but they're not, I wouldn't call them ubiquitous uh, by any stage. Those are fairly early. Uh, the outside plant domain is a little bit, a little bit different equation uh, than doing something for upsite. Uh, outside the, the HFC domain, of course, EPON and GPON solutions will also continue to evolve to higher line rates, and that's already being, being addressed in standards bodies to, uh, to come up with higher line rates for PON. And, of course, wireless backhaul uh, that many of us as uh, network operators are involved in will uh, place additional demands on the uh, capacity between uh, in the access network. Um, so one of the things that we're going to have to really spend some time working with our supplier community on is RF amplification. Uh, GAN technology, gallium nitride technology, has been around in the industry for a while. Uh, a lot of the uh, fiber deep nodes that are being deployed today, most of the, the uh, HFC nodes, nodes today, the 1 gig and 1.2 gig, deploy, at least in the output stage, a GAN amplifier. Uh, the challenge that we see here is that as we add more and more and more RF spectrum to that device, that requires, uh, since we're going higher in frequency, it requires potentially higher output levels to overcome the loss of the uh, coax to get to uh, the next amplifier. And the combination of that more spectral loading and higher output levels puts a real challenge on the ability of that device to generate the total composite power of the RF spectrum and its, its uh, corresponding power, uh, and just moving to 1.8 gigahertz, we're, we're bumping the ceiling on that. The amplifier technology itself is, is improving, uh, but it's not as simple as our drop-in upgrades of the past. We've, we're all used to being able to say, well, if I needed 40 dB of gain at 750 megahertz to overcome the loss of a span in my unity gain network, then I'm going to need 43 to do it at 860 megahertz. Okay. And that's served us very, very well uh, for decades now. But when you talk about an amplifier that's got, you know, 40-ish uh, gain today at 860, and now you want to run it at 1.8 gigahertz, now you're looking at 60 dB of gain. And the challenge there is how do you position that 60 dB of gain with input power and output power where you're not either in compression because you've bumped up against the total composite power capability or you're in the noise floor of the input stage because you're, you're hitting it with too low of a level. So it's, it's tough to find the, the, the sweet spot for that. Uh, so that's gonna, we've been working with uh, uh, the device manufacturers and talking to the integrators, of course the, um, the folks who make the, the finished amplifier products and we've got a lot of work to do, but we're making some good progress. Uh, there have been continuing improvements uh, in GAN technology. Uh, the, the big steps, you know, the, we don't expect a lot of people to come knock on our door in the near future and say, hey, we figured out a way to get another 3 dB of uh, total composite power. Those big steps, I think we've already taken. Now we're looking at a couple of tenths here and there maybe. So. So extending the slope, that's what we've done for years. It's just like, well, if we have a slope on our network, I'm trying to do this so it works for know, your you perspective. Way. This way. 
Uh, we're used to just continuing the slope of that line onward, assuming that we can do it indefinitely, and it's, it's based on the fact that the coax has more loss. Well, we can't do that anymore. Uh, some of the, the use cases that we looked at uh, had us in the, the high 60s for DBMV output level on the highest channel. Uh, and we're giving us total composite power requirements in the range of 82 dB, dBmV. Uh, and that's just unattainable uh, with the current products that, that are out there. So, and think of it as, you know, basically twice the RF power. Uh, the way that we've always looked at, at RF power on our networks is logarithmically, and it can, it can kind of lull you a little bit into thinking that adding a couple more channels isn't that big a deal. Right. But if you, if you distill everything back to where you're actually working with what's additive in the network, which is the watts that are being generated and the watts that are being consumed, uh, it, it paints a little bit different picture. So, and, and we'll get to that in a couple of graphic slides uh, in a minute. So. Uh, the other challenge is that uh, we're going to start losing more and more frequency capacity to diplexing if we're using traditional diplex filters, right? It's, diplex filters are, in the case of a 5 to 42 megahertz network, it's about 25% of the center frequency is the guard band between the downstream and the upstream. Uh, for the, uh, the current 204 megahertz return, it's between 22 and 23% of the uh, center frequency. And that translates at 684 to something between 120 to 140 megahertz of spectrum that's unusable due to this guard band. And that's a pretty significant dent, right? You get to the point where, you know, you've got, you're pushing double digits as a percentage of your total capacity that you've invested in that are lost to guard bands. And, and that becomes a, a challenge that uh, I think we need to, to try to find ways to minimize that. People are working on, on better filtering to do that. But with passive diplexing, it's always going to be there to some extent. If, even if we could improve it to you know, 15%, uh, it, it's still a significant amount of bandwidth loss. This is kind of what it looks like as you, as you grow the spectrum and, and move the center frequency, or excuse me, the, cut up, the uh, center frequency up, that band gets wider and wider and wider. Right. Pretty well understood stuff. We need some, we need some uh, you know, filter magicians to come up with some new technologies that will help us with that. Uh, echo cancellation is something that's been talked about extensively, uh, and it'll continue to be talked about extensively just because of that, right? Can you really give up 100 megahertz of spectrum on your network, uh, and, or do you need to find another way? Right. And in, in theory, uh, echo cancellation would allow us to not just be able to reduce that guard band down to virtually nothing, but also to be able to, to move the upstream and downstream boundary uh, relatively seamlessly. Uh, and uh, the, the challenge here is, the, the quintessential challenge, the challenge that's always been here is can, can we afford it? Does it consume too much power? Will it fit in an amplifier? How many watts do you have to be able to dissipate to operate it? And can we maintain it over time, right? So those are the, we ask ourselves those questions every time we go look at new upgrade technologies and we'll have to ask them again, uh, in this case with echo cancellation. So this is uh, just a little uh, design exercise that I did with uh, uh, some uh, charter systems that are out there today. Just three different cases of uh, uh, you know, the existing spectrum, the first one being a 750 megahertz system, uh, 51 dBmV at the high end, 40, 40 dBmV at the low end, 54 megahertz. Uh, and then one that was more moderate with 40 dBmV at the high end and 30 at the low, and then one that was fairly conservative, uh, 40 dBmV at, the, at 860 in this case, and 27.5 dBmV on the low end. Uh, so those, and those are the actual, uh, actual power. They're not uh, virtual analog. Uh, before we get into that, that use case, this is, this is what we typically think of uh, when we map out uh, our network uh, with the cumulative RF power uh, stated in dBmV. And like I said, it can kind of lull you to sleep a little bit because it's just, it's just a long straight line that goes on forever. This is the exact same thing, but instead of doing the logarithmic dBmV uh, chart, this is just the cumulative wattage 
so this is what's really happening in that output uh, amplifier stage as you, as you start adding more and more and more spectrum at higher and higher and higher levels. So it's, it's, it's a more dramatic increase than one might think. That's the point of that. This is those three uh, cases. Uh, it's a bit of an eye chart. Um, these, as you look at the left column, you'll see continuous slope uh, with a 5 to 204 return. That's what the CS204 stands for. You'll see a 3ZZ204, which is three zigzag. And uh, Shaw showed something uh, that is indicative of what, what, what I'm talking about with zigzag, which is you continue the slope out, and then at some point above the current cutoff, probably above a gigahertz or 1.2 gigahertz, we drop back down and then, and then continue on again. Uh, so it, it just takes everything down by some number of dB. In this case, three, and then I did five. And uh, then I did the same thing with a 492 megahertz return down at the bottom. And all this is is there are two different um, uh, GAN amplifiers right now uh, offered by each of the, the two primary manufacturers. And one has a lower power consumption, but a little bit lower composite power output capability. Uh, and they're, they're similar for both. Uh, so they use the same technology. And I then mapped out the results of using those slope curves with dropping in the, into the existing design. And the ones that are green are the ones that did not exceed the total composite power capabilities of, of those particular amplifiers. And that's assuming at the output port. Um, it, it, It'll, it'll confuse you a little bit at first because when you see their data sheets, they'll say that they can support 75 dBmV of total composite power. And that's true, but you have to get through the diplexer, you have to get through the test point, you have to get through the signal path in order to get to the output port, which is what we design from. And there's a 3 to 3.5 three dB uh, loss along the way to do that. So that's been factored into this as well. So as you can see, less than, a, less than the majority uh, of these were able to support just a flat-out drop-in upgrade. Uh, that means that uh, we've got some work to do. I'm not saying that this is representative of the majority of Charter's plant or anybody's plant. This just happened to be three examples that I grabbed out of, uh, uh, out of some profile books. And this is the continuous slope spectrum, spectrum uh, that I talked about. This is the way that we've traditionally gone out up and, and done our upgrades. Nothing, nothing magical there. This probably looks pretty familiar. It looks kind of like a spectrum analyzer display. Uh, and then uh, this is the, uh, the zigzag that I talked about, where basically at 12, 18 megahertz, the, the high end of the um, uh, DOCSIS 3.1 uh, spec, at least that most people have implemented, we drop down 3 dB and say, well, we're going to have to find a way to make up for that in the DOCSIS 4.0 uh, design spec for CPE. There, boy punting the challenge to Shaw and his team to say, well, figure that out, guys. <laughs> uh, so from there, I want to spend just a couple of minutes on taps and passives as well. Uh, it's important because there are so many of them out there, right? For every node, we've got, you know, 30, 40 amplifiers. For every amplifier, we've got a whole bunch of taps. Uh, and for every tap, we've got a whole bunch of CPE on it. So again, it's on you, Shaw. Um, Greenfield designs, uh, we can probably use higher tap values, uh, and that's going to bring with it the need for conditioners because the, uh, the, high, the high attenuation in the return path that's experienced by, a, for example, a 32 dB tap uh, is prohibitive to the CPE. It, can't, it just can't generate enough signal to get through the cable loss and through 32 dB of uh, loss in the directional coupler that, that supports that tap. Uh, so those are, those are some things we're going to have to look at is how do we do conditioning. And conditioning now can no longer make the assumption that, well, it's always going to be, you know, 5 to 396 megahertz and then some other number to 1.8. Different MSOs are probably going to run different split, split frequencies. We're doing that today, but not, it's, it's not as uh, widespread. Um, it, it'll be almost universal going forward. Uh, certainly, the, the full duplex uh, networks will, will be different than the uh, expended, extended spectrum HFC, ESH. Uh, and uh, within that community, and, and I'm certain within Charter, we will have some systems that are maybe 5 to the 300 and some that are maybe 5 to 492. 
it's inevitable that the demands will be driven by the local market and, and the type of services that we're offering in that market. There's some crazy things that we discovered as we were doing some of the modeling, uh, and, and the third bullet on here is one of them. Stinger length. Um, just the, the, the pin connector and where you cut it off. And everybody puts the little trim guide on their, on their housing. They've got it cast in at, at some expense that we demanded that they do. And when the technician goes to cut the stinger, they kind of eyeball it from a three feet away and say, I, I was always told it's the width of your clients plus a quarter inch, so you just cut it there. Uh, but every manufacturer uses a different stinger mechanism and seizure mechanism inside the tap. And if you get it wrong by just a couple of millimeters at 1.8 gigahertz, you create these big suck outs in the frequency response of that tap. So that's one of the things that as an industry maybe we need to start thinking about is like, well, is there a way to just standardize that so that we don't have to do that anymore? Just engineer the problem away and say they're all gonna be exactly this long and let the manufacturing community respond to that by designing that mechanically uh, into their taps. So. Uh, make before break connections. Um, as we started to deploy remote PHY devices, remote OLTs, et cetera, it pretty quickly became apparent that the impact of pulling a tap plate out to replace it because of a broken port was significantly greater than it used to be. It used to be a you know, three second glitch uh, that you know, the customer's internet connection would go down or you know, they'd get a, a black screen on, on video and it'd come right back. If you do that with a remote PHY device, a remote Mac PHY device, it's going to reboot. And that reboot process is not seconds, it's minutes. Uh, so what seemed like a simple act of pulling a tap plate out and replacing it because of a broken port that was causing ingress now creates a, for the entire service area of that remote PHY device, an outage that lasts three to five minutes, some, in some cases more than that. So we've got to take a look at that. The, there's, there's no documented standard for it, but we've got to find a way to get these fast enough to be able to, to not reboot the devices, whether that's the remote device or whether that's the modem itself. And that's probably less than 10 milliseconds. Uh, the numbers that we've heard most commonly are around seven milliseconds. We don't know yet if that's fast enough for everything, so we've got some work to do. And you know, we've got some craft work to do too. You can't, you can't just like be jiggling this thing back and forth trying to get it lined up just right Meanwhile, making and breaking and making and breaking that connection, uh, that's going to be a problem as well. So we probably need to do some things like put some guide pins or something on taps so that that becomes a fairly smooth process to do. Uh, we've taken a look at uh, what's next, uh, and because there's always another upgrade, right? Uh, the one thing that we've been fairly blessed with as an industry since the 90s was that the housings that we put in the field were capable of supporting the next upgrade and the next upgrade and the next upgrade. So we started when, when we have to splice something in, uh, the labor cost goes up significantly, the length of the outages to do it goes up significantly, the cost goes up significantly. So you have to think about, well, how long do I want it to be before I have to do this again? And the longer the better, right? So most of what we're looking at for housings that are going into the network, connectors that are going into the network, et cetera, we're looking out to three gigahertz. We don't know what the spectrum from 1.8 to three gig is gonna, is gonna be used for at this point. Doug's gonna come up and present DOCSIS 5.5 next, uh, but uh, that might be it. It might be something completely different. So. Uh, Customer prem equip so spoke to this, higher sensitivity for lower input levels, higher transmit power for, to get back to the first amplifier. There's a lot to follow on, uh, on customer premise equipment. But we've got some time, uh, so I think, it's, I think it's incumbent on us as an industry to, to get it right this time. We're, we're developing the 4.0 specs right now, uh, and uh, you know, we want to be as future-proof as we can without uh, overspending. Uh, some people may decide that uh, if the housings they have out there support 1.8 gigahertz, they're going to ride them for a while and do another technology refresh, you know, five, ten years down the road. Uh, we've got to look at uh, power consumption. Uh, we've got to look at uh, whether or not echo cancellation is uh, cost-effective and, and technically viable for us in the access network. We've got customer premise wiring challenges to deal with. Uh, do we want to 
you know, treat devices as gateway devices so there's no splitter in front of them. That's, that's great if we do that, but we've still got all the legacy equipment out there to support, all the CPE that's sitting behind four-way splitters, and we don't have taps that have two different output levels on them. They're all, they're all the same, so we have to have backward compatibility. And then what do we do with what's above 1.8 gigahertz? So that's, I'm going to leave that up to all the younger folks in the room to figure out. Okay, thanks very much. All right, who's got a burning desire to ask a question here? Step right up. We are at time, but we can fit a question or two in here really quickly. Oh, come on now. Dr. Rannick, yes, with that voice, project. Yeah, that's a, that's a big challenge that we're going we're gonna to have to deal with, and, and, and you're absolutely right. Uh, there's, there's some thought that says, well, you know, given that this is completely different, right, you're, you're talking about many, many, many devices transmitting in the upstream direction as opposed to one continuous uh, signal that's traveling downstream where the level uh, and the relationship between that signal level and what's getting out of the plant is, is fairly predictable. Uh, if you thought about like, transmitting something from the CPE back upstream, you're, it, it's coming from you know, hundreds of different locations uh, at any point in time, just within a given node area, and each of them experiences different loss as it gets back up through the network before it gets to that leak. And that, you are absolutely right. There is a lot of work to do on this. I do not have a proposed magic solution for that today. But I think Doug's going to start a working group on it. <laughs> yeah, Ron's worried about airplanes falling out of the sky. I'm worried about messing up my GPS on my phone, which is at 1.5 gigahertz, by the way. So uh, extending the spectrum is going to create opportunity. So other questions? We are at time. So I think, you know, takeaway, state-of-the-art modem here that's coming out from uh, the chip suppliers, just incredible what's actually going on in these modem SOCs these days. Um, and Charter gave lots of hints on this new HFC ecosystem that's going to be built the next couple of years or decade or so uh, as we extend the spectrum out. So. Thank you all speakers, thank you all for attending. Uh, we'll see you at the next one.